what I'm interested in is saying, look, I've been doing this sort of thing for the last 25 years and I'm still not doing it as well as I should. So how do I just continue to do what I do, but do it better? Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Rhinoplasty podcast with me, Dr. Cameron McIntosh. We're in the month of May interviewing rhinoplasty exports experts from around the world and very proudly supported by Carl Stortz to bring this program to the listeners in 70 countries around the world. And today, my guest from London, England, is no other than Julian Rowe Jones. Julian, thank you so much for being on the show today. Cameron, pleasure. Very good to chat with you. So I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing more about this. I mean, Harley, Harvey Street, as I understand, in London is where yeah. the pinnacle of medicine is in the UK. How did you end up working there? Yeah, good good question. Um, I had as my boss when I was a senior registrar, Ian Mackay and Tony Bull, who were the doyens, the top guys in the UK at uh, Rhinoplasty, and they were both in Harley Street. Um, I actually chose to live outside London, um, so I have a practice outside London, but I enjoyed the time in London and my kids are in London, so I, I joined Ian for a while, Ian Mackay, in his rooms in 55, Harley Street. Um, then then stayed out of London for a while, uh, came back, worked in 152 Harley Street, which is an old bank, huge vaults under, underground where the money used to be kept. So that was quite fun. And in fact, now, interestingly, after COVID, um, I do more consultations online, certainly as a first step. Um, and actually, that works really well. Patients don't have to invest as much in terms of their time, emotionally and so on. But it's a chance to get to find things out. So I do less consulting in London, but I have moved some of my surgery to London. And uh, it's in a hospital called Cadogan Clinic near Sloan Square, fantastic part of London. Um, enjoy time out, meals afterwards with friends. Again, another chance to put myself with the, with my kids so they uh, they take me out for a beer. So so it's just a great combination, you know, of of work and play. Really, really great. So I have to tell you the story because I don't think you're actually quite aware of the influence that you've had on my career. One of your fellows many years ago was a South African, Carl von Weick. And um, yes, Carl, yes, yeah. yes, and Carl actually <laughs> was one of my mentors and he ended up encouraging me to actually finish ENT surgery and go and write the board exams in facial plastic surgery. He was also one of the founding members of my executive on the on Source, our rhinoplasty society. So, and through that, we've been able to have all the webinars and run this podcast. So, I have to give a shout out to you that you might not have realised <laughs> the effect you had on Carl, which had on us, and now is around the world. Well, that's very kind of you to say so. Uh, it was great. Carl was one of the most diligent guys, and if you said, look. I think we should, well, he'd say to me, I think we should write this up. And I said, great, do it. And he would do it. So, and then, you know, blood is strong and the pull of South Africa was strong and he went back and I, and, and I, we, we email every now and again, but that's great, you know, to feel that I enthused him and he enthused you is a really, really great thing. And you're doing all this now, Cameron. So that's very impressive. Yeah. And also there's another interesting story is, the, the chapter that the two of you wrote in Anthony Sclafani's book on rhinoplasty, I ended up buying the book and kind of randomly looking up somebody, and it was Faisal Apaden, and I invited oh, yes. myself to, to go and visit Faisal in Turkey. And as I was about to fly out, he just said to me, listen, are you sure you've got the right address for your book to see me? And I was going to go to Istanbul and knock down to Izmir. So he was also yeah. hugely influential. It was a great book. I really recommend that book to you anyone who who wants to make a career out of rhinoplasty tony's a, tony's an academic guy and again you know huge diligence and application to um bringing some mental discipline to to to, to it um so yeah yeah it, uh, one of the interesting things about rhinoplasty is you you know there's such a range of people who are if you like um oh enticed um into into it because there's there's the creativity there's the craft which i think really interests me um and that's part of why i think it'll be interesting for us to talk about performance um but then there are others who like to measure like to take a much more left brain approach to things 
and there's space for everybody. So, um, so, so, and I guess that's what makes your podcast interesting because you've got such a range of us, haven't yeah. you? Yeah. So t- tell me, how did you actually get into rhinoplasty? Was there a moment that like that aha moment that this is where I want to be? Good question. And I've, it's funny how often you get asked that and how you reflect on it. I think for me, number one, there's a, there's a, there's a purity to it. You don't need a robot. You don't need an endoscope. Um, you don't need hugely sophisticated um, apparatus and equipment. Um, you don't really need lots of assistance. You know, so there's something very uh, there's yeah simplicity. Is something I always aim to get back to. It's it's the Steve Jobs thing, the Leonardo da Vinci thing. You know, simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. So I think. There was something about about that that appealed, um, but also it's difficult. It was it's that blue ribbon operation in facial plastic surgery. So maybe you think, well, if I want to be challenged, I might as well be challenged by the thing that's hardest to master. And and I think it was that as much as anything um, that that really set me on this sort of lifelong wish to try and control it which you know we all do till the day we do our last one yeah no i think like i i follow a lot of your social media and things and the, and the that your projection is exactly this it's this like absolutely professional guy who has this like you say the simplicity approach to getting great results and and uh it's it's inspiring to see that to see how academic you are as well but let your results speak. You don't have to go out there and like Rod Rorick says, everyone's world famous on their own website. One of the yeah. things that stands out for me here is that it's not like that for you. You get great results and um, it's wonderful and you teach and you share the knowledge. So it's a, it's a good thing. That's very kind, Cameron. Thank you. Um, I think also what is one of the frustrations too that one has to accept is that you don't get the result you want every time by any stretch, by any stretch. Um, and then you try to understand why you didn't. And sometimes it's very difficult because there is no easy lesson to learn. You can think, well, I'm sure I did everything right, but it still didn't work out. So, so I just have to park those and call those a cold case. And maybe I'll be able to come back to them one day um, when we know more, but at the moment, I'm just going to have to leave it. And I, and I can't understand it. And I've even found that, you know, when you take some intra-op pictures, you use video. And even then, when you look back at what you took during surgery, it's distorted. You're still an outside observer. The, the angles can be different for the camera. And you still can't explain why it didn't work out. And, and that is hugely frustrating. But it's something we just, just have to accept. Um, you know, you go to meetings and you hope you get another answer, um, and sometimes you do, but but it's a tough mistress, isn't it? You know, really, it really is. And this, it's the not knowing. We're all control freaks, um, and and it's the not knowing that's that, that's frustrating. And you have to have, I think, some psychological technique to deal with your own failures and your, your and your and your own shortcomings. So that that brings me the two key things I want to chat to you about is that is perseverance like how, how do you prevail through the times when you don't have those great results and the second one is i want to understand this concept of precision rhinoplasty so perhaps you can tell the listeners what you mean by precision rhinoplasty bit of context perhaps um i i uh, i thought well do you know surgery should be about elite performance and we hear so much about the support that athletes get, the attention that athletes have to their performance. We hear about uh, marginal gains, and we hear about great teams that have achieved with that sort of approach. And I thought, well, why does nobody ever say, take that approach in surgery? We never hear about generic performance, um, number one. Number two, Again, using a sporting analogy, I love to ride my road bike. That, that's really a great thing for me. There's a famous American cyclist called Greg LeMond, 
And he said, it never gets easier. I just get faster. So, you know, the clearly things that I would not be happy with now, I might have been happy with five, 10 years ago. So we keep raising our own bar. And if you're not careful, all that does is demoralize you and you get negative. And then you say, uh, you know, then the fear of failing takes over. Then you think, well, actually, do you know what? I just don't want to do that sort of case anymore. And so on and so on. And at the same time, I was talking to a colleague who's a headhunter, and he he runs an extremely successful international American-based headhunting company. And when they're putting executives into new positions, they give them psychological coaching to help them manage their own expectation and to help them identify what it is they're really wanting to achieve. And I thought, that's really interesting. So that's what really interests me now. So I'm, I'm, I'm much less interested in a left brain reductionist approach to surgery that says, if you follow this algorithm, you'll get the right result. I'm, I'm, I'm much less interested in, do you do dorsal reduction or do you do push down or whatever? What I'm interested in is saying, look, I've been doing this sort of thing for the last 25 years and I'm still not doing it as well as I should. So how do I just continue to do what I do, but do it better? And that and that relates to things that the Stoics told us, you know, in 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 300 BC, really about resilience. It's about it's about having a positive mindset. It's about having a learning mentality rather than a judging mentality, which is a a naive, stupid way to do things. So, so so for me, it's um, it's about reconnecting with the things that you love, consciously saying, okay. Why did I choose this in the first place? Why do I really love doing this? And remembering that. And then during surgery, not thinking about the outcome and what the slides are going to look like at your next lecture, but thinking, okay, I'm here and I just want to control the things I can control to the best of my ability. So that that's the performance related thing. If it's a good result, that's a bonus. But all I can do is control the bits I can. And And people have written about flow. And so it's the concepts of flow. It's focus presence, acceptance, and determination. And you can read forever about each one of those things. But but if at the end, the, f- the phrase I really like is that gleaning a quiet moment of satisfaction at the end of surgery, you put the, put the instruments down and you're not running around and, you know, singing along to Guns N' Roses. You just think, you know, that was, that was just, that was just great. And you feel it inside. Um, now it could turn out that they have a bleed, they get an infection, but I can't worry about that. At that moment, I did the best I could. And 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 that, and I think if you do that, and then if it doesn't work out, as I say, you're not judging yourself against, well, I bet, I bet Cameron could have got a better result. And actually, I saw his slides, beautiful results. How do I get those results? You know, rugby, Dan Carter, he doesn't, he doesn't convert every time he kicks the ball, but some days it's raining, some days the ground is wet. It's not every day a sunny day with, with you know, um, so 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 it, it's realizing that you have to accept these things and um, and just do the best you can at the time. And and there are lots of sophisticated different ways of doing that. But that really interests me. And I think, and speaking to someone recently who understands a lot about these things, I said, look, I th- I think I really try and flow quite well now. So so what do I do? And 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 she said to me, identify in advance the things that. Uh, the things that are really difficult for you and just really concentrate on those. You know, and then you don't hear the music playing in the background. You, you know, you, ju- you just, you just don't, you're really honed in on the bits that are difficult. Um, and I think that's what marginal gain is really. Um, so identifying the things that you love, thinking about those rather than all the extraneous things and what everybody's going to think of your results and then concentrate on the really difficult bit really super concentrate um and and i and that to me is going to provide me with more reliable and consistent results and and a better sense of personal satisfaction than saying do you know what i'm going to relearn my swing i'm going to use this technique now not that one so 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 that 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 it's a very personal approach but that's that's where i am now wow no thank you for sharing that that's it gives me so much to think about. I, I think back one of the key moments in my Olympic paddling was uh, uh, 
possibly one of the yeah. nicest quotes is by Sir Steve Redgrave. So um, you obviously know him, but for the listeners who don't, he's one of the most successful Olympians ever. For five Olympics in a row, he won the gold medal. And he got interviewed and he said there are two kinds of athletes who go to the Olympics. Now, I'm saying there are two kinds of rhinoplasty surgeons who do rhinoplasty because to get there, it's difficult, you know, to qualify for the Olympics. And he says there are two types of athletes who go to the Olympics. Athletes who go to win the gold medal and tourists. <laughs> and I thought, it great. And I think this is it. This is there's that special like thing about how can I improve my performance? I'm not interested in the audience. I'm interested in sitting in this moment, this kind of hallowed moment of, of two hours or three hours in a person's life where I want to improve something that I've worked that hard for to get, the, get to. That's fascinating. Eh? Well, with your history of Olympic sport, you really know what I'm talking about. And it does amaze me that that's never been transferred to the surgical arena. It's a very strange thing. Um, we, I suppose we, we grow up in medicine with, you know, grand rounds and morbidity and mortality meetings. And one surgeon says, your anastomosis fails, mine never fails, you know, therefore it must be your fault. Well, that's just, that's just ridiculous. I've been at an, I've been at a rhinoplasty meeting and the perp and the, the session was entitled um, cases that have challenged me. And one very eminent rhinoplasty surgeon stood up and said, nothing ever challenges me. And I thought, well, make of that what you will. But I, I didn't think that showed a great deal of insight or humility. So, um, <laughs> so, 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 you know, that's some interesting mindsets in all of these things, but, um, you know, you, you 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 can only control what you can control, and and um, and then. You know, it, it, but you've got to choose to engage in the first place, haven't you? Again, you know, mixing sport and and surgical metaphors. But there's a guy called Paul Fornell who writes about cycling, and he was writing about cycling at Mont Ventoux, and he said, if you don't want to find out, if you want to find out about yourself, cycle to the top. If you just don't want to know, just don't start. So, so, so you, you, you've got to engage rather than just be a, a sort of passive entrant into these things. Um, and I'm all for people who innovate. I think it's fantastic. Um, um, you know, and there are pioneers uh, who bring on new surgical te techniques. Um, but I think, you know, it's, you know, it's not innovation for the sake of it. You've then, you've then got to, you've then got to um, be very, diligent about ensuring that you know it's worth trying a trying a new golf swing you know i mean you know why not try and perfect the swing you've got rather than stop and start a new swing if there's not a really clear-cut yes. difference in benefit yeah yeah okay um let me try and change tact uh track a little bit here in terms of the the key because obviously they're not just rhinoplasty surgeons listening to the podcast quite a few patients also do what are your mm. big take-home messages for patients who are considering a rhinoplasty? Very good question. Really good question. Um, you know, you, you look at the, the websites out there and they say, make sure your surgeon's done X number of this and make sure they're, you know, of this organ on these organizations and so on. Um, I guess that's better than nothing. But I think patients, patients it's hard. But I, I think a patient needs to sit down and really work out, number one, as much as language allows for them to put into words what they're trying to achieve physically, cosmetically. You know, because I, th I understand it, but if a patient says, look, you choose or you tell me what looks right, that, that's not a good thing. A patient's got to understand what it is they don't like. And they've got to be able to articulate it so that we can understand. Now, image manipulation is very helpful as a tool, but, but they've had to work out in their own mind what it is they don't like and want to achieve. I think they've then got to be confident that we're on the same page as they are. So that means intelligent listening on our part, not just, yeah, sure, in you come. Um, we really have to listen. And there are times when I'll advise patients against surgery not because I don't think I can make the nose look better, but because I don't think I can make it look better in the way they want it to look better. 
So I think I think it's so important we've heard what they say, and that requires skill and performance uh, values, if you like. Um, and then I think you know, is the surgeon honest? Uh, are they transparent? Have they told you about risk? Have they said that past performance is not a guarantee of their result? Um, so, so I think I, I, I think feeling that there's a good relationship and good communication is is vitally important. Um, I don't think numbers is necessarily such an important game. Um, yes, because well. Coming back to it, you know, if, if we again talk about sporting analogies, a lot is made of purposeful practice. So you do your 10,000 hours and then you do purposeful practice so that you recognize what it is that needs to be worked on and you just keep pushing and pushing. So it's just beyond reach and then you get there and then the next one. The trouble with rhinoplasty is that it's what it's what the psychologists call a, a wicked environment rather than a kind environment so that, you know, it's not like swinging a golf club, that there is a way to do it. And if you could only just do it that one way, you'd always hit the ball straight down the middle, 250 yards, 300 yards. There are so many variables in rhinoplasty that just thinking I can do another and another and another and get the numbers up is not the same as that purposeful practice thing. Um, so, 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 you know, a lot of people say, well, how many have you done and do you do this? I'm not sure that's necessarily so helpful. Um, it's difficult, though, isn't it? Because because these are these aren't black and white things. People like certainty and people like black and white. And they say to me, how confident are you that it's going to turn out like this? Now, if you if you're an honest guy, you say, I'm confident that I know how to do it and I'm confident that it's the right approach for you. But I can't tell you that it's definitely going to work out like that because I can't control everything. So it's they, they want your confidence. But if you're honest, you know, you're going to say, I cannot guarantee it. And that's a tough one for a patient. And they may have well seen someone else who says, yeah, no problem. I can definitely get that for you. And then how do they choose? It's really difficult. Oh, but Laura, but I guess in the end, you just have to be yourself. And, and then the patient, you're either a good fit for that patient or you're not. Really. Yeah. So one of the things I think in London, surely it's like a melting pot of cultures. You must see the entire spectrum of different ethnicities come across into your room. I mean, that 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 just purely, forget about everything, it's just the skill of rhinoplasty and the difference between an Asian, maybe a Caucasian and Metia and African, there's a whole lot of different noses. Do you do the whole rainbow of people who come in? I, th I would say that... Um, the Oriental Asian population is not currently that big in the UK. So if I see a patient who's Korean, Japanese, Chinese, um, generally speaking, unless it's a small specific change they want, I would usually say, do you know, um, I'm not the right guy for you. Um, and, uh, and so I would say that. Um, I don't have a big um, experience in in the black patient population, um, but again, one has to be really careful because Africa is a huge country with a huge a huge. You know, you can't say this is what you do. For, again, it's that reductionist left brain thing. You can't say this is the right technique for an African rhinoplasty because because it's just naive. Um, I think it's very difficult for patients because you know there might be somebody who looks at Beyonce and thinks, well, Beyonce has got a small nose and that's, and she's a black girl. Therefore, why can't you give me that nose? And so you have to be careful and explain it's not, you know, that that's an oversimplification. But I think one way or another in the UK, we certainly have a, uh, you know, I have a big part of my practice is Indian subcontinent rhinoplasty patients. Um, and, uh, um, and again, but again, you know, every patient on their every patient on their own merits. Because I gave a talk once on on, on ethnic rhinoplasty, and basically I said it's such an unhelpful term. Uh, there are six thousand ethnic groups or, or so in in India, and you know, a northern Indian patient may have a completely different 
set of um, anatomical features than a southern Indian patient. So again, it's understanding what that patient wants and working out what's possible for them. So again, I'm, I I don't think it's that I don't think it's that helpful really. You know, we can point out certain things to a patient. You've got thick skin, or if you're Northern European and you're you're, you're fair hair, redheaded, pale skinned girl from Ireland, you've got very thin skin, and so there are pros and cons. But again, I don't think I don't think ethnic groups are particularly helpful, really. Um, but yes, it you know there's there's a vast array of different noses that we have to help with. Yeah. Okay. Another question. Advice for the beginners listening to the podcast. <laughs> Just a sentence, even that. I'm pausing, aren't I? Because it's difficult just to give 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 a sentence. Um, I think before you even start, recognize that getting con- getting good results and getting consistently good results is really difficult. So if you're not prepared for, well, certainly this is my experience, but if you're not prepared for for having to really think hard for, if you're not prepared for setbacks, it's, it, it's not the right thing for you to do. It is millimeter surgery because, you know, it might look millimeter right in two particular planes of view but if it's a millimeter right in the third plane of view and you didn't see it on the table because you don't always it's going to show up afterwards um i think also be prepared that um that 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 patients quite nice that you're operating on patients faces and and there's a there's a you know a, a significant psychological responsibility to take on there because if if it doesn't work out, you know you can you can really you can really you know you can really make, upset someone who's vulnerable, and and that's difficult as well. It's why I work. It's why I arrange for every patient, every patient I see, to see a clinical psychologist. And it's not just any clinical psychologist. It's 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 a clin- it's clinical psychologist I work with and talk with every day. Um, it, in the UK, the General Medical Council and the College of Surgeons and the British Association of uh, <laughs> BARPS, the British Association of Aesthetic Plastic Surgeons, says that every patient who's considering aesthetic surgery, not just rhinoplasty, should have a psychological assessment. Well, I think, okay, if that's the case, then they should have the best psychological assessment. And whilst I have obviously an understanding of psychological assessment and, and antennae that are sensitized after 20 30 years of of doing this the patient should see the best and that's why i arrange for them to have that psychological assessment performed by a clinical psychologist and then we talk together um that is afterwards that and is that, so interesting so okay so if a patient's now making the appointment or currently through covid it's a zoom appointment is one yeah. of the insistence you have to go and see this person because yeah, you know, that's to me it's it's almost a little bit of uncomfortableness of saying okay so okay does that mean both functional and and aesthetic rhinoplasties or any rhinoplasty across the board if you want to get operated by julian Rowe jones you're going to be seeing a psychiatrist psychologist first if it's pure function pure function then no but again you know you have to understand the patient's expectations because there is uncertainty in complex functional structural cases but if there's any element of aesthetics any element at all then 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 yes that's that's non-negotiable because i don't think i don't think well i'm not a specialist in psychology so you know and and so, and so the people i work with are specialists not just in psychology but in body image psychology and um you know, and they'll they have an understanding and see things in a different way that's complementary to mine, but have an understanding that and an expertise that we can't have as surgeons. I, I think the other thing too is it's a little bit like reconstructive plastic surgery. Ideally, you have one person doing the resection and one doing the reconstruction, and the reason you separate is so that the guy doing the resection doesn't compromise the resection to make his reconstruction easier. 
And so if you therefore have someone who's not invested in the potential reward and excitement of doing the surgery, they won't be as they, that that element of bias is taken out. But you do have to be very sensitive. Uh, well, firstly, I, I I hope I convey that if you see this as a hurdle you've got to, to do, then that's not the right way to see it. Um, it's not just okay if I've got to, I will, because because it should be perceived, and I very much hope it is, as being in their best interests in helping them, as we said earlier, put into words exactly what they hope surgery is going to achieve for them. Um, it's not just, well, I'll feel better because my bump's not there. It's about articulating why you hope it's going to make you feel better. Um, so, so plus, you know, there are things that are helpful about adapting to change afterwards. We know that it takes time to adapt to looking different. And sometimes that can be disconcerting. And the more we can understand that individual patient, the more we can help them and 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 achieve a positive experience rather than just a less negative experience. Um, so, so I think it's I think these allied things really really matter, um, you know. And and if and if we miss and if we miss something, and we operate on someone and we think it's a good result, but the patient doesn't, then that's a situation we all find a very difficult one and we don't you know and and revision's not the right thing to do but a, a patient may feel crikey you know you've got to you've got to operate because you haven't achieved it and it and it's you know and that's not good for anybody so you know i think i think if you put your patient's best interest first that that special psychological assessment is is really valuable really positive I, I, I think it's it's kind of weird for me listening to you because i'm getting this jealousy that i used to have on the british olympic team where they've got such a holistic <laughs> approach and then they we, we we're in africa and we're training and we we don't have that incredible support system i think it's fabulous eh? okay so i guess we're really lucky aren't we two, we're, two we're last questions lucky. because the, um, there's sure. so much information you've given me i mean frantically making notes of what i want to add to my practice etc two questions to, to to finish bringing back to the sporting analogy so the the one moment where you're like going the alp du is you know and you break yeah. when was that one moment when things just fell apart and and it was a really bad result or something didn't work out with the patient and the other one is the time that you actually got to the top first that Great moment. <laughs> yeah, it's the, you ask the difficult questions. Definitely, Cameron. Um, so, so, so the the, the disappointing. Part, well, I guess you know we probably, if we're really honest as surgeons, there's probably not a single. I mean, okay, I rate my results one to five, and and you know it's easy to do that on a database. One, I've never clicked five. So I have clicked a few fours, which is great, but I've never clicked five because you look and you there's every time you think, do you know what? One more millimeter here or just a little touch there. So um, but it's when that becomes unhealthy that 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 you don't get to the top. It's when you it's when you beat yourself up and you think, I, I just don't want to. It's that fear of failure. I don't want to take this on anymore. Um and that's when you've got it out of proportion and you are, it's what it's that judging mindset, which is unhelpful. I, you know, when they talk about pessimism, which is a downward spiral, it's that thing that it's personal, pervasive and permanent, you know, so when it doesn't work out, you say, well, it's my fault. So it's personal. If it didn't work out this time, it's not going to work out next time. So that makes it permanent. And it's not just in rhinoplasty, it's in the whole of my life, it's pervasive. So clearly that's unhealthy. And 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 that's when it's good to have a beer with you and, and others to say, for goodness sake, you know, your, your results are fine. You know, so so I guess it was just cumulative rather than one horrible incident. But equally, you don't know when the other moments are going to come. Um, I saw a, a woman yesterday who I operated on a year ago. And she's really happy with the, the result. And it was in it was it was one of the patients I'd first operated on in the new hospital I work in near Sloan Square. And uh, as I, at the end of the operation, it was just that gleaning quiet satisfaction thing. And 
and the nurse just looked and smiled and that that no more was needed to be said you know and it, it just it didn't bleed and the, and, and and the tissues just did what you wanted them to and you weren't aware of the passage of time it just it just and so i try to visualize that now before every every new operation so i guess that's a, that's that is a bit like at the top isn't it you know and you you know you you, t- you turn the wheels and and the bike just the bike moves and and you know you're not screaming for oxygen um and i and i guess that's that's when i that's when it's nice and um and i guess to some extent that's why the real finesse rhinoplasties are the ones i enjoy the most now when yes you you've got plenty to you've got plenty to lose because they're they're not they're not horrible ugly noses and and you really want to get it right and that is uh, a more personal challenge for me than a rib reconstruction fifth redo which i just don't think my personality is right for and so that's when i would say do you know what there are others who who are really great at that and they really enjoy that whereas for me the challenge comes in in other areas yeah julian thanks eh? um it's so inspiring uh i'm sure the listeners around are going to be commenting a lot about this um shout out to carl stortz again for bringing this program to us and personally Absolutely. thank you very much for for today uh, it's been a scintillating 35 minutes of listening to you um last question is sure. if people want to come and visit you in in london is the, is there a possibility for like an observership or anything like that for for people to reach out and come and see what you do that they they're very welcome to to get in touch through the website is the easiest way it it all depends on what's happening it, it, it's a it's a challenging one for me because if we're talking about performance again distraction is one of those elements that takes away from performance so uh, sometimes people come in and i say look please don't ask me any questions don't talk during because you know let, let's talk at the end and that's great but yes you know it, it's lovely to learn from others as well you know I, I you know you and i need to have a beer and talk and you can tell me about performance and olympic level of performance so um you know it's a great joy to learn from others so um yeah, yeah and, and just do get in touch i can't promise because you know, it, it depends on, 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 on other things. But yeah, I'd love to hear from people if right. that's what they like. Well, on behalf of all the listeners from the Rhino Plasty podcast, thank you so much. And uh, we hope you get a couple of fives in the next few weeks. Eh? <laughs> Cameron, you're such a star. Thanks so much. <laughs> Take care.